I texted the group. Okay. Yeah, so anyway, they did not respond to, they did respond, but they did not respond to the core uh, issue that was brought up by Vinay and Tracy. So hopefully they will and we'll, we'll get to the bottom of it. But yeah. there were multiple levels of error. And, um, you know, it was very clear that the NIH was very happy to get this result, which they went, did a pr press release on it, you know, kind of a, so, um, bananas mm -hmm. like like crazy town bananas they just make stuff up well and then their toolkit their little misinformation toolkit i haven't even looked at it is it that's is it very hilarious? <laughs> is it vivek is that vivek murphy's thing where he's like here here's how to know what's misinformation if it's not got the u.s government seal of approval on it or something like that or yes Basically, the premise is if it didn't come from us, right? Then it's misinformation. Okay. That's right. Okay. It was wild. well. It makes it easy. It makes it really yeah. know, simple for us. If you I have know. to think about this with your own brain, no. Now I don't want to have to think. Don't do it. Don't do it. You. Come. It's just come easier back. and it's safer to just yes. do what you're told. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> it's so crazy. It's so crazy. <laughs> well, as soon as they start this thing on their end, we'll start. Um, hello, the couple people that have joined us. Hello. We are um, kind of piggybacking on the Epoch Times stream here uh, with their permission, obviously. But the idea is to get this, uh, this awesome video with Jay Bhattacharya, uh, Scott Atlas, and Martin Koldorf um, to, as, to as many people as possible. So we are sharing the share. Only come with us if um, if you weren't gonna already go watch it. Yes, that is true. Come with us later. Are you saying yes, we have no value add? I mean, come on. <laughs> we don't. We don't really have anything to add. But I put the link to the Epoch Times in the description, and here we go. Yeah, go check it out. If you're if you're already apologizing, if we're if you're here by accident, we're sorry. <laughs> Yeah, right. If you're at the wrong one, check the link in the description if you want to go over to the Epoch Times. They have a cool little chat going on. And um, I think that this is to get um, to drive, you know, some awareness of, of their site and their content and get some subscriptions. Yeah. And they do they do they do do really good stuff. So please Absolutely. go over there. And also what Hillsdale's doing with the Institute for Scientific Freedom, like drive some awareness of that. Cause yeah, Hillsdale's great. All good things. I, I, Even as an atheist, I support Hillsdale. I like what they're doing. Yeah, me too. There's a lot of diversity of thought over there that um, Agree. you can't find. Well, I mean, a lot of places. It. Did you guys I see that article? I'm sorry. Go to head, Jeff. No, it's just you. You look at our, our kind of historical centers of of academia, and you know there was a time when you know religious institutions welcomed and you know the Enlightenment, the era of the Enlightenment. A lot of them were you know religious people and. Um, you know, the his, the, you look at the history of a lot of our traditional, you know, Ivy Leagues and you see there was a tradition there of, of um, you know, tolerance, tolerance and understanding and, you know, science and literature. You know, there's a we've, we've definitely moved a lot, a lot, uh, a lot further away from open inquiry and progress, and progress. Right. Exactly. It's, it's amazing. You know, there was, it used to be where the religious institutions were, were about social progress and, uh, and that included, um, you know, open dialogue and debate and, um, right. so. And it seems yeah. so basic, right? That's the basics. You, you, you gotta yes. talk about things and figure them out. It's almost like a pendulum swing of like, well, you know, anything kind of maybe right wing or on the right, you know, that might be a little more conservative than than uh, that we like. It's like, we no, we have to come up with an opposite of that just for its own sake, you know, mm -hmm. or, um, you know, well, we don't like this traditional religion. So we're going to do our own religion. We're going to call it science. And we're like, oh, OK, well, <laughs> you know, there's a the uh, just speaking of the Surgeon General and the misinformation, you know, it, it, I, I truly believe, and I think, you know, Jay and Dr. Atlas would probably agree with this. Stop selling Americans short. Stop making them, stop assuming they don't have a way to critically appraise information Great. or to weigh and balance things. 
Um, but what we're, what we do and we say that's misinformation or that's, you know, um, we're giving people what we've, what we've actually weakened science by giving just an interpretation or an application of it and saying, no, you in the course of these last two and a half years, doctors and experts have told me they've seen an unprecedented assault on free and open scientific discourse with potentially deadly consequences. Today and tomorrow, I'll be joining the Censorship of Science Conference at Hillsdale College's Kirby Center in Washington, D.C. Tonight, you'll be watching the public part of the conference, where we'll be hearing from three major thought leaders that I've previously had on the show. Former Harvard epidemiologist, Dr. Martin Koldorf, Stanford Professor of Medicine, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, and Hoover Institution Senior Fellow, Dr. Scott Atlas. All three are founding fellows at Hillsdale College's Academy of Science and Freedom. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellick. Love it. I love this stuff. Winning so far. Beyond infection, and those issues uh, include a politicization of science, the scientific process has been damaged, and uh, the free exchange of ideas, frankly, is under threat in the United States. To combat that, uh, we need to do more than just fret about it. And so uh, Dr. Arne, in his wisdom, uh, has initiated this new academy uh, for science and freedom. I am Scott Atlas, one of the uh, co-founding fellows, along with my colleagues, uh, Martin Koldorf and Jay Bhattacharya, who I'm sure everyone here knows as well. It's a great honor to be working uh, as a group with everyone here. And uh, we have a particular, uh, I have the particular pleasure of introducing uh, Martin Koldorf tonight as our guest speaker. He is someone who doesn't need an introduction, but it's such a great introduction, I'm going to give it. Martin uh, was a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, uh, and for over a decade, uh, one of the world experts on statistical analyses of uh, spread of diseases and surveillance. Uh, he was uh, a consultant and on certain committees of the CDC and the FDA. Uh, and has helped with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, uh, and as a member on the Drug Safety and Risk Management Advisory Committee of the FDA. Uh, Martin has developed statistical and epidemiological methods for disease surveillance uh, and uh, novel statistical analyses uh, for uh, indicating not just early detection of disease outbreaks, but also uh, drug and vaccine safety surveillance, which is of some relevance these days. <laughs> so. uh, Martin uh, has developed uh, statistical analyses that are used today uh, in the CDC uh, and in places like New York City and other health departments to monitor COVID-19. He is truly an authority on all of the things that we think uh, he might know, but he is more than that. Martin is uh, really uh, one of the most courageous people of all the colleagues that I have come to know during this uh, pandemic. I almost said during this fiasco. Um, Martin, uh, people may remember that I uh, received a, a sort of a censure by a group of professors at Stanford University Medical School. And Martin Koldorf was the only scientist in the country who had the guts to go public and write a letter to Stanford, not only in defense of what I said, but specifically challenging all the signatories to a debate on the issues. Needless to say, zero accepted that challenge to debate Martin Koldorf. So uh, it is really a great pleasure and honor to. Uh, he was also a uh, human rights observer in Guatemala. Institute 
uh, which was uh, always that's an interesting courageous uh, and honest individual and as a friend martin was a good bit on his background yeah I wouldn't debate Martin. That's for sure. Uh, well, it's just it's typical for the last the, two years. For the uh, to the Kirby Center and the Hisler College for hosting us uh, both today, and uh, also uh, for uh, this initiative of the Academy uh, for Science and Freedom. I think uh, uh, science is broken, and we need to build new institutions that can help uh, save science. Science is broken uh, for, for the long term. Um, uh, I do a lot of uh, uh, statistical and ethnological methods, but I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm not going to show you a single mathematical formula today. So uh, um, instead, I'm going to talk about censoring in science. And it's sort of a personal experience. And as I, t as I tell you this story, you have to realize that there are other scientists who have had more or harsher censoring on them than, than I have had. But I'll tell you my story. Uh, and then uh, you can sort of imagine how other people have, have had similar stories. So if you go back in history a little bit, two years, to March of 2020, when we first uh, heard the news about this new disease outbreak in Wuhan, um, I was very afraid for, for about uh, 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> because as soon as this pandemic, uh, I love that. I thought it was going to like which were the two countries outside of two weeks China or got a curse, months I realized that we are going to get this. This is going to spread throughout the whole world. There's absolutely no way that we can stop it. Uh, it's so contagious. It spreads without us knowing about it. Uh, so that was very clear. And of course, I'm a father. I have three children. So as all parents, I'm much more concerned about my kids than about myself. So I wanted to know, are they at risk? So I looked at the, the Wuhan data, uh, which was sort of the only good data available to them. And I saw this risk factor that uh, while, of course, anybody could get the disease, uh, be infected, there was more than a thousand fold difference between the young and the old. And I thought, well, this is sort of important information. Yep. because It really determines what strategy we should use for this disease. Uh, I was no longer uh, concerned about my kids, they were do fine. I was sort of in the mid, mid group. And uh, of course, for all the people. It's amazing how uncontroversial on sure its that, face uh, they are protected. that very proposition should but be. But I tried to sort of publish this sort Agreed. of simple calculations, but it was uh, difficult. I wasn't able to do that in the US. And maybe it's that I only have 20 years of experience as an infectious disease epidemiologist. Maybe you need 30 or 40 years, I'm not sure. <laughs> or maybe it's because yeah, yeah. I was only a professor at Harvard University, style. and maybe they wanted a more prestigious uh, place. Yeah. But I'm not sure why, but I was unable to do so. Um, so eventually, I, I posted what I wrote on LinkedIn, because I can post whatever I want there after after or four weeks of trying. Uh, but of course, I figured that, okay, nobody wants to hear this, but it's important actually that for historical purposes that, that it's clear that there were people already back then who knew these things and knew what sort of was the appropriate approach. I remember this. Protecting the I was old, just going to ask if you guys read that. So I did. It, yeah. I put it there just to have it as a historical document. There and, was some uh, good stuff on LinkedIn uh, early on. Of Sweden. So I was reading the Swedish uh, approach before they started paper. censoring everything. It took me and uh, maybe till May afraid to afraid because there was a debate in Sweden. Was, I was sort of afraid that the I wasn't. Was there I mean, there who it wasn't. Uh, I mean, already uh, written and even me. I've written off example, like all the right books. So under the like, pressure, so I morons, said, you know, well, I should write. In the Michael Swedish Levitt was my first. Michael Levitt was my first one too. The two major daily newspapers. There was no problem at all getting published in Sweden. Um, and I figured that, well, if Sweden can hold out until the summer, then everybody will see that that was the right approach, and then everybody will follow Swedish approach, and good. Good. Um, boy, was I wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to admit when you're wrong, right? Eventually, I published it in English also in a, a sort of obscure uh, a UK uh, uh, online magazine. Uh, oh, I remember that. I remember this one, too. Yeah. So if we jump forward a little bit... It was sort of frustrating the uh, with the difficulty of, of getting one's voice heard. And uh, 
I tried many different things. I, uh, I actually I managed to get into CNN, uh, write an op-ed for CNN Espanol, uh, because I know how to write Spanish. Uh, the English version, English CNN English did not want it, but uh, I, I was so. Uh, but we were trying to think how can we sort of educate the journalists more? How can we get out this message? And Scott was very heroically saying things, but they were always dismissing him. He's just one person, and he is. Uh, Cardiologist and blah 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 blah, and other people were sort of dismissed because they were one person or they were not. There was always something wrong with them. Yeah, this guy with two decades so of was defining so all the processes the that the CDC us, uses me, and, and the New York Dr. Department Dr. of Health for outbreak should be completely And uh, Dr. Dr. Yeah. Gupta, who is the, in my view, the preeminent infectious disease technologist in the world, we got together and we wrote the Grant Barrington Declaration, a one-page thing. We argued for better focus protection of older, high risk people uh, at the same time as we let children and young adults live uh, uh, near normal lives uh, so as to minimize the collateral public health damage from these lockdowns and other measures. Isn't it striking how non uh, like, this well, sounds so uh, that reasonable? Was, uh, because I'm, I'm living in the world where people it think it's crazy, and I can't wrap my brain around it. And every time I read uh, an article about it in whatever the newspaper attacking it, they would always have the link to the declaration that says yes. Because then at least some of those reading it would actually click on it and actually read it. And uh, by now, I think about 90 Isn't it amazing how people just don't people actually have, read uh, the primary sources? This, uh, declaration, which, uh, like people don't go to primary sources, they read thankful. opinions about it and then they go off. You uh, know? The reaction from the director of NIH, Francis Collins, was uh, he wrote to Tony, that is uh, Dr. Fauci, um, look at this, uh, uh, the proposal from these three fringe epidemiologists. Uh, uh, you have two of these fringe, fringe. epidemiologists here in the room today. Who the the Secretary Asa, who is Secretary of Health, uh, Health and Human Ever. Services, seems to get attention. It needs to be a quick and devastating published takedown of its premises. I don't see anything. Is it underway? Uh, so, what do you think uh, Dr. Fauci responded? I am passing below a piece from Wired that debunks this theory. Not uh, the Lancet, not uh, New England I'm, Journal I'm, of Medicine. I'm sure this uh, Wired. Uh, journalist is probably a, a very fine young man, uh, but uh, it's a little bit surprising that Dr. Fauci uses him as the authority on epidemiology. Uh, he's a journalist uh, who typically covers the climate, food, and biodiversity for Wired magazine. Uh, but maybe he knows more than Dr. Fausch. I, I don't know about these matters. It wouldn't kind of surprise me. But uh, maybe he knows he more. He has another than email a few days that. later, also from uh, uh, Dr. Fauci. Uh, he thought that uh, we were similar to the, those people who denied AIDS uh, a couple of uh, decades ago, which is kind of strange because uh, the purpose of the Great Barrington Declaration was to argue for better focus protection of those that are at highest risk. That was a major part of it. So why would we do that if we don't believe COVID is real? So I, I don't quite get the logic, but... Uh, and that was the mistake, uh, one of the mistakes the Fauci made with AIDS. So uh, right. there was he an brought the population uh, to grand grandmas and toilet seats, and everybody can get it. Everybody has AIDS. With yep. Various sort of strange yep. accusations uh, that it was let it rip, which is just the opposite. Involving uh, weirdos were, like uh, far right wing uh, Pat uh, Robertson uh, to we say like crazy weird exorcism, stuff and you know, uh, eugenics, marginalize people for absolutely no reason. That we did financial gains, even though the opposite is true. We were accused of threatening others, which none of us have done. Uh, Trump and Libertarian co funded pseudoscientists, and I would receive a free lunch when we were at, in Great Barrington uh, uh, writing this declaration. And one of these is actually true. <laughs> there, are, there, are, there is such a thing as a free lunch, actually. We did get, actually, we get two free lunches there. So that was kind of nice. That was good food. Uh, other than that, uh, yeah. Uh, well, so it. it's all bullshit. The focus of this talk is uh, how censoring is both direct censoring and sort of uh, other forms of it. So 
when the Great Barrington Declaration came up, uh, at the very beginning it comes up top in the search engine of Google, but then suddenly it wasn't there. Instead, what was there was those who criticized it. And uh, other search engines had it at the top, but not Google. And there was some, uh, uh, there was some uh, sort of discussion of that, and then eventually a week or so later it came back up. Uh, so I guess, but Google always denied that they did anything. Uh, there were some issues with CDC, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. So I'm going to just tell you what was censored. Uh, so here was CDC. That's like it could be from today. 2021. So I was serving on the a committee, a working group for vaccine safety of the COVID vaccines. What's been really amazing uh, to me is, point, is uh, how okay CDC with that many people are in, because it, it's in because the direction some, uh, that they like. Issues of you know, and culturally how worrisome that is. For me. Young women <laughs> under age of 50. But they decided to pass the vaccine for all age groups. So I, it was very clear from the data. And one of the things that I spent many years on is to figure out how to, as quickly as possible, find out whether there is a problem with adverse reactions or not using what's called sequential analysis of a weekly looking at data. And it was very clear to me that there was a concern for women under 50, yes but there were absolutely no evidence. And there was actually evidence that there was no concern for those over 50. And those are the ones who really need these vaccines. The purpose is not for the, uh, the, the, the young women or even young men. That wasn't the primary uh, beneficiary of this vaccine. And the J&J &J vaccine is sort of important because it's a one dose. So it's, used, it's good to, to, to reach uh, uh, hard to reach people like people in rural areas or homeless people where it's hard to get the second dose. So it's a, sort of important that. So I just, uh, uh, after I sort of decided to, uh, they weren't quite interested in my views on the matter. So I wrote a thing in, uh, in The Hill, uh, arguing against passing this vaccine for older adults. And then they removed me from the committee. And four days later, they, they lift. Uh oh, I lost the feed. Me too. Now I remember AEIR. That was that was some good stuff coming there when uh, when Jeffrey Tucker was doing. Honestly, I haven't seen. I haven't even kept up with it since they formed Brownstone. So. Um, It's so funny, this sort of whole, <laughs> I would love to quantify how many people actually, someday we should do like a, uh, like a trivia night, <laughs> just right. for all of these like events of like, hey, who was in April, 2021, what scientist was, you know, <laughs> removed from the CDC vaccine safety panel for yes. advocating for, for vaccines. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That would be like a funny, that'd be like a funny, wacky trivia night that only, you know. Only like five few, of us. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> rational ground nerds and, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think more people have been paying attention than we think. Oh, I think so, too. I think, you know, you know, personally, I, I interact with a lot of um, Clinicians, researchers, PhDs, MDs, I mean, just personally with through personal correspondence that tell me things that, you know, it's sometimes I just got one dumb little Twitter comment like, you're not a medical doctor. How dare you give advice? I'm like, well, I don't give advice. And you're right. I'm not a medical doctor. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, it's it's uh, the, the concept of. I'm, I'm happy to take medical advice from, you know, a personal you know doctor or a clinician that is treating me for some particular but I don't necessarily want their philosophy advice or, you know, <laughs> sociology or psychology or physiology advice or political advice. And, you know, they've essentially taken political, ideological, sociological um, uh, beliefs and or assertions and, you know, wrapping them in the... Um, wrapping them in the messaging and the sort of the propaganda of, of, of medicine and, and public health. And so it's kind of like, no, pub, public health is for public. You know, what's right. really amazing, um, 
there's a great podcast from the Akad and Coca report. I don't know if you're familiar with those guys, but they're a couple of cardiologists and they have a podcast, but had some great debate, some kind of left wing public health guy. And, and, they, and one of his assertions, was, we need we actually need more right wing people, kind of conservatives in in public health if we care about public, because we've got. Right. If we I mean, it, it's not just the people we, we need to be able to take science and data and, and things that do in, improve health and it. Everyone needs That's to hear that. But then the damage was kind of made. Even right. Because- people. We need to reach. We need to. We need to reach the height. You know, the second wave. So, Sorry about that. So those who didn't get it. That, How long was uh, it paused? Uh, oh, like. Uh, so I, mean, I guess I'm the only I it was like uh, person who's been fired by CDC for being right. too pro vaccine. That's it. There's the line. Got fired by the CDC for being too uh, pro. In uh, also in, in the spring of 2020, I wrote uh, on Twitter. Uh, somebody was asking, do you think that uh, uh, young people should get vaccinated? And what about those who have had COVID already? So I said, no, thinking that everyone must be vaccinated is as scientifically flawed as thinking that nobody should. COVID vaccines are important for older, high-risk people and their caretakers, not those with prior natural infection or for children. So to me, that's sort of just basic uh, epidemiology. Nothing strange with that, but... uh, uh, Twitter has some uh, some people who have who who I guess they they consider themselves to be experts in this area, uh, and they didn't like it, so they uh, censored it uh, so that nobody could uh, uh, share it or reply it or like it, uh, which basically means that pretty much nobody will find. Uh, later on, they they locked me out for I think about three weeks or so because. I tweeted about <laughs> masks, saying that yep. by claiming that masks are a good protection, some older people will sort of believe that, and they will go and do things and uh, uh, get infected, thinking that it protects the way it doesn't. And uh, that's not so good. So What's the medical I, term I for the misinformation about the masks? <laughs> but, uh, I guess... Uh, that uh, made took uh, for three weeks. I had no access to uh, Twitter because of this tweet. Uh, here's another yes. one. Uh, it's just I another guess, uh, example of how uh, it's there was not an article uh, published by Brownstone Institute were, by you know even people who are uh, like, oh, well, 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 black well, studies well, at the uh, University of okay, so Santa Barbara. Ninety percent. And here was the very interesting uh, uh, historical study of how this, masks you know, has been, sort of been used historically. Do you actually care uh, about, for life example, health? to silence slaves? And uh, he talked about uh, uh, Anastasia. Who's I'm interested in this thing, psychological stuff, the cultural stuff. Like, slave. Yes, uh, he's not wrong. And, uh, this was incredible. Was this article at Brownstone was really it Twitter. So that was makes you think about the the visceral. Uh, Facebook, no. they took down the Great Barrington Declaration page for a week. What it represents, you know. No explanation. Yeah. Um, the offending post was that we argue that with the vaccines, which at that time had just come out, we should prioritize giving it to the older, high risk people. And that's what caused Facebook to close uh, oh, the. I remember down. that. Yeah. Wow. There was sort of some protest against it, and therefore they took it back it. up again uh, after a week. Uh, but uh, that was the Facebook censoring. We had YouTube. Uh, we did a roundtable uh, in April with uh, Governor uh, uh, Ron DeSantis in Florida. Do that. And uh, uh, no. Dr. Scott Athos, Dr. 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 Shaya, and Dr. Sutta Gupta. And we talked, for example, about the fact that uh, children don't need to have masks. And we argued against vaccine passports, which sort of there was some rumbling starting about vaccine passports. Then we sort of started, let's try to uh, argue against that from the very beginning before it sort of takes off. Well, uh, so that was removed by YouTube, which is uh, owned by Google. Uh, uh, LinkedIn, which is owned by Microsoft, they also sent. So this was an article, uh, uh, this, was, this was an interview I did with uh, Epoch Times. and. Uh, uh, on the dangers of vaccine mandates. Now, they are a little bit nicer, I guess, because they, they only you can see this post, so I could still read my post. 
but nobody else could. So at least they didn't remove it from me. So uh, that was, was uh, yeah. Wow. He always looks on the bright side. You uh, know? This was another one. Uh, just, I actually didn't write just anything. Just the goal I just, of these uh, companies, you know, the that, people that are doing this in these uh, companies, uh, to uh, think uh, LinkedIn they know post better by a guy from Iceland. And what he did, he just uh, cited what the Icelandic chief epidemiologist had said, which is also the equivalent of the CDC director in the US. So this is the official uh, public health authority in Iceland, uh, but that was censored. Um, I mean, if there's going to be another end of this spectrum, another one, uh, yeah, they were I, a little bit harsher because not, not even I was it. allowed to read this tweet. They removed it completely. Even that, I was arguing that uh, let's talk since about it. The people who have recovered from COVID, they are the ones who have the best immunity, better than those who are vaccinated. Yeah, it's really so the other ones are least likely to spread really, it to others. Of a large so hospitals should hire tech workers nurses like that, that or doctors like that, to, and use them. For the okay. most frail, oldest patients at yes. the geriatric ward, so the ICUs, because they're the least likely to infect you know, these patients. Deboosting these things and uh, instead the hospitals were firing them. I mean, but, it, it uh, is LinkedIn did not enjoy an ideologically motivated. Here's another one. Them. We together with the, Dr. Dr. Baracharya, who wrote a, a Newsweek article about true. how Fauci yeah. fooled America with uh, the various things about public health. And uh, LinkedIn took that away also. But uh, Microsoft News, they actually republished it. So one arm of Microsoft is censoring this article because LinkedIn is owned by Microsoft. But sure. another part of Microsoft is actually republishing it. So I shouldn't be too, I guess, upset with Microsoft here. But it's a little bit. Uh, so I guess they are sort of, uh, maybe they should just sort of skip it, I guess censor themselves, I guess, or something like that. Uh, here's another one that Microsoft uh, or LinkedIn didn't like. I sort of, during the AIDS pandemic, we blamed the sick, we stigmatized gays, we did fear mongering, we ignored the poor, slow with treatments, and NIAID was uh, headed by you know who. And during the COVID pandemic, blame the sick, stigmatize unvaccinated, fear mongering, lockdowns harm the poor the most, slow with treatments, and NIAID is uh, directed by you know who. Uh, yeah, yeah. So people who are targeting to learn. Yeah. And like hopefully Voldemort. one day we will learn. Voldemort. Yeah, this is. Uh, later on, uh, LinkedIn actually uh, closed down my, uh, uh, my account. And uh, uh, Jeffrey Tucker at Brownstone, he then wrote an article about it, which then got tweeted. So I never asked to be reinstated, but they did it automatically. So I think somebody at LinkedIn read this, what Jeffrey wrote, and sort of reversed the decision. I feel so, like he could go on for uh, hours. Was, uh, I mean, yeah, this Matt is just, it's before. like daily. We're Spencer, getting examples of this. I mean, it's, firing it's, staff it's with natural immunity after COVID recovery, hospitals got rid of those least likely to infect others. I think this is. So, right. Yeah. Uh, an epidemiological fact, but that was the that was the the tweet that got me in trouble. So uh, is he fully suspended now? Or uh, is Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook—they have permanently suspended many accounts. No, they let him back on. Uh, scientists, on and I have continued to speak up, but I'm being, I have self censored myself because these are important channels of communication, so I don't want to be removed. Which is so what they I'm want. Careful with that's what they do, right. yep, that's right. And it works. And for a while I was thinking, well, I don't really want to do that this because I should to tell what I want. And so maybe I should just forget about Twitter and LinkedIn. Of silence in the middle and I talked to uh, a dear friend of mine who is uh, also in the faculty I might be left -wing, at, uh, right -wing, at might Harvard, and really her family uh, comes from Slovakia, and uh, her family was very active. The middle against the communist regime in Czechoslovakia. Silence. Uh, and her grandfather was like one of the leading dissidents out, there. She you so told me, right. No, 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 no. Um, if you are you can't afraid just walk of away. Has you probably have to use whatever they allow you to use. The fear of. And then you have to be careful to how far you can go so you keep influential and in what's perpetuated uh, in a lot of these harmful Other things. Otherwise, you'll win. So she convinced me sort of to, to okay, I need to continue. Uh, That's why I turned my camera back on. 
because that is a huge point. Everybody thinks that con there's a consensus. But, I hear it all the time. Oh, but the overwhelming it leads to consensus says and also it leads to self censoring because we don't hear the, don't anything that's not the consensus. Of victims and if we do, it's people that get because they see that somebody else thrown is into the trash bin of okay, I don't want to be suspended. You know, so and us, be careful you know, we're what I say. yelling into and the wind. We don't have anybody to listen because we're considered the fringe. Of those things. And sometimes why they sort of kind of randomly select who they censor and what they censor because they want people to be uncertain about what they can and cannot well, say. That's interesting. Um, but there are things that are ways to fight censoring. I think one is through exposure, using alternative platforms, but we cannot only use that. We also have to use the one that reach the most people. And then uh, some uh, some jujitsu maybe can be used. Uh, so for example, when uh, Robert Malone was censored, was uh, removed from LinkedIn, other people were sort of complaining about it and saying that it's important that scientists uh, can have debates. Um, and uh, uh, otherwise, uh, it leads to bad public health. And uh, so he was removed from LinkedIn. And so I wrote this Twitter thing, and I actually did a screenshot this morning. And if you can see there on the right, they are sort of suggesting other people I should follow. They think I should follow LinkedIn, which I'm not doing. They also think I should follow Robert Malone, which I would be delighted to do. Uh, the only problem is that uh, Twitter has suspended his account also, but they still want to recommend that I should follow him. So at least that's nice. Yeah. And you notice that <laughs> you notice that they remove his bio when you click on his thing, but on <laughs> the advertisements for his account, the bio is still intact. I know uh, that. So. Uh, the alternative platforms, and I have, uh, I sometimes post on Getter, Gab, Parler, and Speaks, uh, and I've never been censored there. There's also True Social, which is a new, uh, new platform. So I think it's important to use that, but I think we also need to use the, uh, heard of the that one. existing ones. Actually, I think Are I have. Are you guys uh, on those? Are you guys you can on also try to make a little bit fun of I people. I got on so Getter. Once um, I wrote an offer, Truth, Trump's uh, Truth Social has a huge uh, waiting with, list, uh, and it really stinks uh, because like all my usernames have been and taken. Like some jerkball like would have got all my usernames for Truth Social. Maybe if I posted on Twitter, they would censor me. So I said, I gotta be well, Eric Twenty Two. Eric, allow me to. Eric, uh, that was a fail. I'm gonna be so we can find out it, on these other accounts. Uh, if earlier this week. Uh, I said, having been censored by Twitter, I must be careful what I write about masks. And then I said, if you do surgery, please wear a surgical mask to protect <laughs> patients. And uh, I think that's, uh, nobody can argue with that, no? Do you, do you agree that surgeons oh, yeah. should wear a mask when they perform surgery? I mean, surgery? I do think there, you do? there okay, are good. some, we all some limit on whether it Nobody helps. can say but, that I said no, that. No, I have like five so studies that have studied uh, the, the lack of viral so, uh, infection. It has of, been really uh, stunning to be a scientist during these last two years. Uh, it's kind of been absurd. Uh, we have That's an NIH director Collins and an NIH director Fauci thinking that you promote science by selling scientists through published takedowns. It's pretty absurd. Bananas. You have a geneticist and a virologist thinking they know Apnelli better than Apnelli that's for Harvard and Stanford and college fringe epidemiologists. Uh, we do lockdowns to protect young low risk members of the laptop class instead, instead of focusing protection on older high risk people. Uh, this mistake led to many deaths and many unnecessary deaths. Um, what did Jay say? People lockdown. pretending to care for the global poor who favor lockdowns that have caused more harm to the poor people around the world than anything other than war yeah, and slavery. For protection for the Zoom class. Or That's class. Yeah. Yeah. astonishing and absurd Sounds in right. my view. Uh, people have been accusing working class people who oppose these devastating lockdowns as being right wing extremists. They're just the one who sort of taking the biggest brunt of these lockdowns. To this day, I still don't know more politics or Jay's or, or, yeah. Uh, yeah, we had scientists signing, uh, signing in Lancet, right. uh, a famous medical journal, publishing a petition questioning national immunity after COVID recovery, something that we have known about for almost two and a half thousand years since uh, the Athenian plague in 430 BC. It's, uh, uh, I mean, I totally it's not surprising that, that uh, national immunity is strong after COVID, and that is better than the, the uh, vaccine immunity. 
we would have been very surprised if it was anything else. Uh, we had a CDC director who believed that face masks provide better protection against COVID than vaccines. And then another CDC director who questions natural immunity after recovery. Uh, we fire people with natural immunity after COVID recovery, even though they are less least likely to spread COVID to others. Uh, CDC was firing me uh, as a pro-vaccine for, for being too pro-vaccine. Uh, big tech sensing apologies to get the pandemic right while boosting those who got it wrong as COVID experts. Sometimes people sort of said, these are the COVID experts and there's people like uh, who, uh, who actually are not even, uh, even uh, uh, who, who don't understand infectious disease Eric technology King, and public Eric health King. at all. And then we have zero COVID. Obviously. I won't talk about that one. So. I think he's a biosecurity expert. Uh, so what are the alternatives? Well, we have debates instead of censoring and slander. Uh, Scott mentioned that I uh, offered to debate any of these, uh, was it 98 or so, uh, Stanford faculty members who wrote this letter criticizing him, and uh, that invitation is still open. If you know any of them, let them know that I'm happy to debate them, either here or somewhere else. Do it. Uh, we should have had discussion how better to protect high-risk older people. We should have much more discussion about all these uh, lockdown harms, the collateral public health damage from these, uh, uh, because public health is not just one disease, it's multiple diseases, it's not just short term, it's long term. So uh, uh, those are basic principles of public health that we have to, to follow, and we didn't during this pandemic. And we have to trust public with honest information, uh, otherwise they're never gonna trust public health and science, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, there's a reason that people don't, there's a good reason why people don't trust public health and science. And I think the Academy of Science and, and Freedom is, one aim is to sort of restore and sort of at least deserve that. And I, and I think that's really the crux of this whole so, thing. Uh, is those were my uh, remarks. Science is an incredibly uh, important pursuit. The in last two years. And I like to invite up to the podium democratic my colleagues, Dr. Society Adams, to function. And to moderate uh, yeah. the Q&A sessions. The here. collapse of trust uh, from in, the, from in, the, in the long term <laughs> between, between anyone who needs to interact with medicine or medical professionals. And, um, you know, to me, I just think of how many people I personally know have been affected and probably have made really poor decisions because they so uh, we'll jump right in. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with these uh, three American thought leaders, genuine thought leaders. Um, and we're actually going to do this as a audience Q and A mostly. So I'll I'll just get us started here. And so, you know, as uh, Dr. Koldorf mentioned, there were you know there's a lot of alternatives to absurdities that are that that were offered, and we've also discussed a bit um, certainly. Um, in the Epoch Times and in discussions I've had with, with all three of you, um, the, the cost, this collateral damage of the lockdowns. And I've learned recently that in the UK at least, um, there were a lot of counter indications like, that the government had information that explained why not to do lockdowns, I guess. And the question that I have is, um, did this sort of thing exist in the US and it was just either ignored or or, or just sort of thrown out. So there was a paper in 2006 yep. by Don Henderson, who is a famous uh, infectious disease epidemiologist. Uh, who, he was instrumental in uh, the eradication of smallpox. Uh, and which laid out very clearly that lockdowns are not the way to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a variety of reasons. And uh, so I think most countries had this sort of pandemic plans so or what to do, and they were all protect those who are most vulnerable and try to have uh, a society function normally. So, uh, and uh, Jeffrey Tucker wrote a very good article just recently about uh, in Brownstone Institute about uh, this uh, Don Henderson and what he said in that uh, paper in 2006. If, if I may add, I mean, this is something that I don't think the public understands that the this is not news that lockdowns don't work and shouldn't be done and are yep. extraordinarily harmful. The standard literature on pandemic management before this pandemic was that lockdowns should not be used because they don't work and they're extraordinarily harmful. Yep. And the key paper that Martin is talking about 
was really accepted. This was a, uh, a complete change in the accepted management of a pandemic, what was done. And, and for all the people who were touting we it. A mic going around, April, and so let's do a question April. from the audience. Uh, right over here, first hand. January, February, they were all saying that. They were all 100% saying, oh no, that, that's, that's never been tried. We could never do that, you know? Yep. What is it that drove what we've seen over the last two years? Was it greed? Was it partisanship? Was it fear? Was That's it the question. Ah, uh, the question of the. The question. Yeah. Not just our government, we have governments around the world and big tech and pharma all this stuff. Why? Oh, I can start. Um, because there, there, it, it, this is always the most challenging question. I get asked this all the time, why? The answer to why is always very mm -hmm. difficult. But in this case, um, I tend to think that there was a confluence of different interests, a confluence of different motivations, rather than this idea that there was one major motivation to do this. And what I saw Agreed. in the White House uh, gives me that basis uh, because what I saw was a combination of gross incompetence, tremendous hubris uh, by people who were protecting their own status and positions at all costs, yes. uh, people with bureaucratic uh, sort of motivations, that's my phrase really, which is not the same as the free exchange of ideas and debating like in typical science pre, uh, before this. Of course, there is a very complex web of funding science that one of this is one of the things. Oh, no. That we want to expose and then fix if we can, uh, where there are attached uh, to my funding headphones. streams coming that. from people who are have massive power, not just over the funding of the research, but of, over everyone's career doing the research. And so university professors who are assistant professors are not going to really feel very comfortable speaking out against the NIH when the NIH is the, the determining factor for their own career, and then big pharma and everything. So uh, the second part of it though, is that there, I, I think we cannot underestimate the fear. And I'm talking about the fear from COVID, even in the people who are making policy. Fear uh, is a very powerful distractor from rational thinking. Uh, and uh, when there is pressure in a situation, I think we all know this in our own personal lives, your, your true nature comes out, your true character comes out. And this was a highly pressurized environment, of course, the biggest healthcare crisis in a century uh, during an election year, which was another motivation that I don't think we can ignore, the political side. So when you have people who are personally afraid and are motivated by extraneous things, uh, it, it's a very, very bad mix, uh, particularly when they are intimidated by people who have their own personal names on the proscribed policy, which was the lockdowns. And so uh, there's no easy answer to why, in my view, uh, there's a tremendous amount of corruption, uh, and I mean moral corruption, not just financial, because the universities, I'll, I'll give you an example, Stanford University receives over $500 million a year in NIH funding. There are some schools that receive over a billion dollars a year in NIH funding. What do you think the likelihood is that those recipients of that money can speak freely? So th there's a lot of motivations. I could go on and on, but I, but I won't because there, uh, first of all, I'm gonna let Jay answer but also because there is no real short answer to the question. So, so I, I don't a lot of people with anything Scott that. Just said. I think all of that is true. So let me just add a couple of notes. So, so, so uh, in yeah. particular about the emails that you saw, the reasons. absolutely shocking emails you saw from Francis Collins and Tony Fauci and, and, and then Tony Fauci about me, Martin, and Sunetra Gupta. Uh, uh, one of the motivations for that was a motivation to create a, a consensus within the public that that a, a, an illusion of consensus within the public that that there was no scientific dissent against lockdowns. The the reason why the the Great Barrington Declaration they reacted that way 
because uh, you know the idea is I, I love them but they're like ancient i mean martin told you like you know we these are not the, the, the idea of protecting the vulnerable i bet you everyone in the audience had that idea during the pandemic right uh, i mean i saw several people in the audience who like very brave people in the, who, who like spoke up around this but the fact that we were from harvard stanford and oxford i mean i never cared before about coming from stanford i'll tell you before the pandemic um but from harvard stanford and oxford and we got this viral viral attention was a problem for this group it posed a political problem for them because they wanted to tell the public that there was no dissent yeah and so they had to destroy us it was a cure they had to do a devastating huge down it was a political problem they were solving uh motivated by some of the things that scott was saying right so i think um so i think that that's the that's the immediate context for why they, they did what they did um the other thing, I, I, so I want to, I want to, I want to be as charitable as I can be. I think there, uh, in science, the norm is we, 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 frankly, science, is, science is just another way for fighting with each other in a structured way. I mean, it's, it's like it's really fun. Like you, you, you know, I have an idea, and I Prasad has an idea. We like fight with each other. And then there's a data, there's some, 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 some like experiment and Vinay turns out to be right. I'm like, oh damn, Vinay, you got right this time. Um, I mean, that's, that's what science is. is. We need like, to, that's agree the to argue. It's like a discussion we among even people who are, we're all equally was struggling with a difficult thing. We don't know the answer. That's, that's the fun of science, right? It has to have that, that kind of norm of a fun discussion with each other um, at, where, where we take each other in good faith. The norm in public health is a little different. Right. In public health, if I, as a professor in a school of medicine, get up and say smoking is good for you, I, I've, I've committed a sin, right? The, the, the scientific literature is completely convincing that smoking is terrible for you. I should not ever get up and say smoking is good for you. I shouldn't even like hint at it. Frankly, joking about it right now is probably going to get me in trouble. Um, <laughs> so uh, I That's going to be an excerpt on YouTube. Oh, God. Please, no. <laughs> Um, I violated a norm, a real, true norm, a good norm, right? I, I have Burns, responsibility Burns, because I, I, I act in public health of not crossing that line and, and misrepresenting what's in the scientific don't literature. Do that. uh, that's, a, that's a true that norm. Public so public health doesn't actually encourage complete free discussion of ideas. I, I mean, legitimately doesn't. But the ethical basis for that norm is that there's a scientific consensus it's, and when you have a novel disease, you have a, new a, a, a situation where there's a whole lot of scientific even if it's uh, wrong, at least it's ignorance. Not we just we just don't know it. about a whole you know, how does the disease tra uh, transmit? Who's really great. most? Who's what's the what's the the risk of dying if you get the disease? How best to treat it? You know, so on and so forth. Um, we use what's established. Well, you don't have you don't have that moral basis. Scientists need to be able to talk freely with each other about these things before you can apply the public health norm morally. And what happened was that. The folks that, that, that Martin showed you, they applied the public health norm before the scientific discussion had actually been done, before the consensus had happened. And it was, it was an immoral act because they, they misapplied a legitimate norm in public health to scientific free, free discussion. Can I add something to that? Because I'm gonna, I'm gonna disagree a little bit. A lot of the stuff was known in the spring of 2020. Disagree. And, uh, you know, the first person that came out with uh, saying that the targeted protection was uh, Johnny. That's right. Shut him down. Knowledge. He's an oh, the great Satan. Stanford. Uh, mm -hmm. And he was met with a backlash. And in March, I wrote a paper uh, on calling for targeted protection, stating some article was at risk because this was already known. Yep. There was a body of literature. It was the pandemic playbook April before this came along. And when I wrote my paper uh, in March of 2020, asking for targeted protection, I sent it to the Wall Street Journal. And this, I'm naming them because I think a lot of people think, oh, there's some kind of a left-wing media cabal. No, it, it really was much more pervasive than that. My, re, uh, my rejection from the Wall Street Journal said, oh, we're already publishing all this stuff on, on targeted protection. And so uh, people, because people ask me, why did the first paper you wrote go into the Washington Times? And I put it in the Washington Times because it was rejected from the Wall Street Journal and it was urgent that this stuff was laid out, that the risk to it uh, was known in a very uh, targeted group of people, that we need to protect those people, that it's very harmful to do the lockdowns, uh, et cetera. And so there was a, an enormous 
amount of information known from studies all over the world. It was known in the, by the end of spring 2020 that we must open the schools. Known, right. it was proven, it was not arguable. The children had an extremely low risk if they were healthy, that most children did not spread significantly the disease, and that there was enormous harm for closing schools. That was known in the spring of 2020. And when you said that, you were vilified, and as Martin articulated here, it was pointed out that you were dangerous. And that's how the lockdowns uh, were, in, were accepted by the public, is that there were, there were two things done. One was everyone who was calling for ending the lockdowns was called dangerous uh, because they were somehow therefore calling for what Martin said, let it rip, herd immunity strategy, no protection, which was a lie. And the second reason was they were claiming anyone who was against the lockdown was prioritizing the economy over lives. Yet there was a multiple decades of literature showing that severe economic downturns killed people. So the answer of ending the lockdowns for saving the economy was because it was lives versus lives. So the, everyone on this stage uh, was vilified to varying extent and demonized as if you were dangerous. And that is why, in my view, the public bought into this, even though it defied all logic. Because when I speak, as these guys do all over the country, everyone in the audience says, that's exactly what we thought when I go through all the data. Because it's simple logic that you knew who was at risk, you do everything you can to protect them, and you don't destroy the people who did not have a significant risk. Common sense. Now I'm really glad I didn't censor him since I just learned something from him. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Super quick follow-up. Um, there seems it seems to be pervasive that there's you know whenever uh, many important issues like this one these straw men are created and attacked and so how do you how do you counter that especially when they're amplified to such a great degree well i mean countering a straw man argument uh it, it happens when i was raising my kids because that was our typical dinner conversation uh, <laughs> but you know honestly the solution to all of this stuff the number one solution to me is stopping the censorship and having transparency of information. You need to think critically. When someone makes a straw man discussion, it's easy to sort it out if you have the information. You cannot, in fact, be, there's no such thing as critical thinking without hearing uh, things that differ. If you only hear one viewpoint, by definition, there's no possibility. Let me give an example of this. So, so they're saying that we wanted to let the virus rip. Uh, that's a lot. We never wanted to let the virus rip. We wanted focus protection of the old. old. Um, the Washington Post, every single time they published a, an article with, with, uh, with uh, talking about the Great Barrington Declaration, had, uh, would have a quote from Fauci saying uh, that this, the strategy was nonsense and that, uh, that, that uh, we, we want to let the virus rip. They never asked me to reply to that. They would just, as boilerplate put, let the virus rip. Um, it seems like journalists have a responsibility to try to get the story, at least the other side of the story. I mean, they can put Fauci's side, but let me answer. Yeah, they'd put that in as sort of a, an official smackdown and just... Right. Something they never said. The war against the virus. It's like the Facebook version of... The very beginning right, but it's Fauci saying that, that they right. said the war it, which gives, it, rather than gives it an official credence. Right. It's very emergency. dangerous. And, you know, we all know what happens in war and, you know, everybody's, you know, striving for consensus. You cannot uh, question anything. And I think uh, I'm coming from a country that had a lot of wars. I was born in Israel. And I, I think that that was an analogy that can explain the mentality and also many of the things that you talked about. Uh, what I wanted to ask, though, is, you know, the base, the infrastructure of science is, are the universities. And uh, one of the things that disturbs me is how universities behaved, not only in terms of uh, what scientists uh, expressed, what opinion scientists expressed or didn't express, but rather that than how they manage themselves and their students. And to, to, to a large degree, universities were maybe the most extreme manifestation of all of these bad policies. They, they actually went to remote studies for, for the longest time possible, other than a few exceptions. Uh, they are now mandating uh, boosters to the lowest risk population from the disease and the high risk from side effects, even for people 
that come 30 days later, they are mandated to be vaccinated. And I, I have to say, I'm, I'm personally, I'm asking myself very tough questions at home. And my, one of my conjectures is that universities are not managed anymore by academics and by scientists. They are managed by lawyers uh, that just say, hey, that's the CDC guidelines without, uh, that's how it over. So I, I wonder what you, your perspective on that. I mean, so like a, a couple of notes on this. So uh, university sent the, the column kids, the publishing column kids, our young adults home um, in spring of 2020. One of the big problems of focus protection is multi-generational homes, right? You have older people living together with young people. We created multi-generational homes out of whole cloth by sending all of our, all of our, our university kids home. Um, I, call them, I keep calling them kids. I, I, people always tell me, like, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Uh, uh, and, but but the but I completely agree with you. The, the 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 policies of the university have followed have nothing to do with science. Uh, what, the, what they the, the, it's it's a form of groupthink. Like each university is copying all the other universities. They're not referring to science to justify their actions. And they're, they're the key thing is they want to make sure that no one dies of COVID in the university. It's fine if they die of COVID outside. If they die, it's fine if they kill themselves. It's fine if they if if all kinds of bad things well, happen to their education. Doing something visible to say well, they it can't failed be in their mission, and it's and it's no, not, it's, it's, the, it's the top it's universities that have failed in their mission. The educational mission, the so research mission, the the commitment we have to the the young adults in our charge. We have failed in all of those missions. I can add one quick thing, which is uh, people don't know this because it's been scrubbed from the internet, but October 2020, the CDC posted a paper on the damage on their policies about schools. I, I was in Washington in the White House at the time. And the CDC said, quote, it is unethical to require testing of students if they don't want to be tested. Unquote. I remember that. It was like five now, minutes. Now, that doesn't even go toward forcing vaccination scrubbed, I'm assuming, it, to yeah. healthy people, young people who do not have a significant risk for serious illness, an experimental vaccine. But they even have forced testing, even though the CDC itself in October 2020 said it was unethical. The point is, we have had a breakdown of the ethical leadership of young people and a, a moral breakdown in the United States, not just by closing schools, but by forcing vaccines that are experimental, that have known side effects on young people who are healthy and have no, no significant risk of a serious illness. If as a society, we're going to claim we need to vaccinate children to use them as shields for adults, that is a complete break in the moral contract that we have as human beings to our children. You are the shields for your children. Your children are not meant to be shields for adults. That's right. Thank you. How is that not self-evident? It's a pleasure and honor. So to I'll make a, quite a, a brief observation question. A brief observation is that when economy and I look at you and you're all surprised because maybe for the first time or for a rare time, one of the precise scientists, scientists suddenly the, the mental is taken and we see how politicized this. If you talk to economists, sociologists, uh, literature department, everything else has been cleared of any alternative thought of any alternative thinking, of anything that doesn't follow the party line long ago. So, you know, you're surprised because because of the nature of your work, you've been shielded from this complete, uh, I don't know what to call it, you know, uh, Monoculture. destruction. Mm -hmm. And I'm also from Eastern Europe, so I spent the first part of my life under similar system. So I'm wow. particularly aggravated that these things start to look a little familiar. The question, though, that I have for you is, we all understand what was the situation here in 2020, the political context, how the whole bureaucracy, the whole monopolies, they were all against certain politicians and certain group and, and everything would work in unison. So my question is, how these lockdowns happen around the world? In a sense, 
every country is an interesting separate case. Did they have a similar political structures? Did they have the, sem the similar uh, censoring? How I know that Sweden had a little bit different, different, but you know, for example, let me reveal that I'm originally from Bulgaria. So these little stupid Eastern European countries, they were all saluting EU and doing whatever they were told to do, pretending that they have local experts, which they didn't have any. So a lot of damage was done to these much weaker economies in the name of uh, life and all this. Emotion. So do you have any views of how different countries, because of their institutional frameworks and their political politics, maybe was not so dictatorial, when we were not so political, maybe they did it better than us. Thank you. you want to talk about Sweden? Yeah, why don't you talk about that? Well, Sweden was very different, I think. And it was a huge contrast to see it living here, but still following the news in Sweden. And every time I thought, well, it's completely crazy here. I read the Swedish newspaper, basically, or it's one place in the world where there's insanity. Um, and I think it's not just Sweden because the, all the Scandinavian countries sort of have had a fairly similar post, uh, policy with among the lowest uh, amounts of lockdowns, as well as now for two years. Uh, among the lowest COVID mortality and the lowest access mortality. Uh, and there was a discussion in Sweden because those who opposed, those who wanted to lock down more, they had some powerful people arguing the case, including academics and uh, uh, the editor in chief of uh, the sort of the equivalent of the New York Times in Sweden. Uh, but if you go to other European countries, I think in the they UK. They right. allowed it. I mean, that's that's yeah. the most critical component here is that um, they allowed that. That was go to, uh, like uh, Uganda. I think it's supposed to be closed for two years. Um, so uh, there were many countries who sort of followed the leads of I think the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, on I, these I matters. And, and if I can add that, that is, I think, uh, that's my perception. There's there's a uh, a massive influence of the Western countries, we you cannot underestimate. It's not just that the United States years. is economically intertwined and therefore years. if we lock down the US, there's a chain reaction and the Western European countries, everyone in the world suffers. When you have the head of the US effort get on TV almost every single day for a year talking about lockdowns, and when you have the United States federal guidance that was locked down businesses, shut schools, restrict, don't see your families, don't see the older people, don't even go into the hospital if you're ill. When you have people like Dr. Fauci, the most visible person on the task force during the previous administration and the head of the whole effort now, and Dr. Burks who was the task force medical side director, when they get up on stage with the president of the United States or next to the president and they put that out there, and it's on TV and in the newspapers all over. These other countries don't just say, we're gonna do what we want. I, 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 don't, I think that's sort of not the way it works. I may be overstating the influence of the United States, but I don't think so. Yeah. They still quote what Dr. Fauci is saying in these other countries. And given that the statistical modelers that uh, Martin can talk about a lot better than I can, uh, in the UK started this whole thing really, and in the US, and they were so wrong, their models were proven wrong, grossly wrong, making false assumptions. But those things were put on for some reason on TV, and there was just a, uh, a herd mentality. And the influence of the United States public health leadership, in my view, is to blame for what happened in the rest of the world to some extent. That sounds right to me. And the failure of the media and journalism to perpetuate that and essentially have complete. Um, we were told at my university that we couldn't come to work uh, to do our research because if it was non-essential. Nobody likes to hear that their work oh. is non-essential. So yeah. I, I converted my lab to a SARS-CoV-2 wastewater covalent, uh, surveillance. Wow. And for the past year and a half, I've generated troves of data on, on virus transmission using w wastewater. And one of the things that I've realized is that, you know, you could plot these data and superimpose when mask mandates are put in or fines or whatever those things and get a really 
amazing picture of how effective those policies are using wastewater. And so I'm wondering if you are, uh, if anybody's doing this on a bigger scale. Like I've been doing it for my community for San Luis Obispo. I can, and I am, you know, I've gotten in trouble for saying some of the things that I have, but it's grounded in science. It's in, 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 it's grounded in poop <laughs> and, 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 and the, transmi the transmission data that I'm seeing. And I'm just wondering if you've, if you've um, seen any of these kind of work, looking at wastewater and correlating trends in wastewater uh, virus loads to certain so, you know, interventions that have been used. So there was a new, recent New York Times story, I don't know if you saw, uh, the, where the CDC admitted to hiding data, hiding information. One of the things that they admitted to, to not really revealing is was their Only wastewater for surveillance. Straight, we've been um, correlating they, they, all they, of the epi curves. And the idea that, that the uh, premier uh, public health agency in the United States is like hiding data. NPI efficiency. I, just, I can't wrap my mind around this, right? like, this, like we, basically, we basically are owed transparency by this. Your work and the work of others who are tracking the 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 the, uh, the 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 spread of the virus efficiently, they didn't. I mean, has gotten no attention because I think again it's the same thing. They wanted to create this illusion of consensus, this illusion of they are control of the science. Anyone who's on the outside, well, you don't. You're just on the fringe. Um, and I think uh, if think of, just imagine how much better we would have done if we'd had all our minds, all the minds of people contributing to this discussion in the in a normal way. Like we would have had a lot more fights, but it would have we would have ended up in a much better place, I think. No, oh sorry, he's he's next in that. There's a microphone there. Oh sorry, yeah. So we worked on a paper very early on, uh, looking at whether the IHME model was calibrated. And so we were the ones that said, you know, the 95% confident intervals control, you know, cover the next day, 20% of the time. That was <laughs> us. So we sent it to a journal. And of course, you know, we're not going to, we're sorry to tell you, but we're not publishing it, yada, yada, yada. And then uh, in the middle of the paragraph was, uh, we don't want people to be complacent. So you can, you know, parse that however you want to parse it. And then they kept going. So it was like this non sequitur sentence right in the middle. Hypervigilance right hyper is thing. a word. I, I don't know to this day. It, every day I think about, about that sentence. That means, but it seems it like these journals were really uh, guardians. They thought themselves as guardians. Physical of the universe, basically. Yeah. That's Can I ask where you Gates funded? What? Where you Gates funded? Oh, yeah, yeah. He gave them $400 million. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he gave that place for it. You can't argue. See, the journals can't yeah, argue with so, that. I mean, like, so there's a, there's a couple of things there. Like one, one is that um, uh, it, it, early in the pandemic, actually even now, there was this cons this idea that if you came out with a result that that underplayed the, the lethality of the virus, that you were going to cause people to act irresponsibly. Uh, Neil Ferguson, the, yep. the the guy who did the Imperial College model, famously gave a, 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 a uh, an interview where he said that that uh, it, it, it was fine if he got it wrong in the right direction, if you overpredicted. The irresponsible thing is to get it wrong in the, in the, in the, the wrong direction, underpredicting. But in fact, the, the, when the World Health Organization said in the early days of the pandemic that the death rate from the virus is 3 or 4%, they're talking about the case fatality rate. It's a very misleading number versus what, what your real true risk is if you are exposed to the virus. And as Martin said, it, there's a thousand-fold difference by age. The, it, it, if we, are you are you underplaying the virus? If you tell people truly, if you're young, your your risk of dying is low. I, I just uh, it's it's a Apparently. it's a use of science to control people, the behavior of people that has no place in scientific discussion. Uh, and I'm, I mean, I I would love to see your story written up and told because yeah. that is that's it's absolutely shocking, right? Well, it's not shocking to me because I remember you sent me your paper. And you said this is back in, I think, spring, summer 2020, April. And uh, you said, I can't get this paper published. Does anybody know and, who this uh, is? Yeah. I mean, this is a, an example of the internal, sort of, there's two types of censorship going on. Alex One is by science itself, the journals, the universities, the NIH, the powerful people. And then there's another type, which is the media. And the media, is the pathway, of course, the interface between 
the public and the science journals. Regular people are not gonna look up the science publication. So the media right. is so critical. And when you have an interface that is the filter and the uh, is somehow the imprimatur of scientific truth uh, telling Martin Koldorf <laughs> that you know he doesn't know what he's talking about, about the vaccines, uh, we're in a very dangerous place. And so this is one yeah. of the things we're gonna try to do with peer review here. There's a, there's a, uh, a need to get more rapid publication with accountable peer review or less obstructive peer review. Uh, and we, and you know, it, so the solutions are not obvious, but we know the problems are very, very profound and we need to fix them. Kind of vain. Uh, when I'm very grouchy in the morning, I think, uh, is there any way we could audit the journals? I mean, let's take, you know, a journal and let's look at the papers on COVID that were accepted and let's look at the papers that were rejected and let's Absolutely. check and let's get the comments. Hey, man. In the, yeah. the Lancet published that uh, surges you know, about, the, about the papers. BS you know, that, about that HCQ. Really, uh, I think that's kind of a Johnny Unitas kind of uh, a project, but, uh, uh, you know, that's something, uh, you know. That guy sounds like RFK Jr. Peer review no, is not, but it, it trash. Excuse me. Yeah, it's not the it's not the be all, is it? It does not work the way they say it does. I well, the, the, like, funding, the funding component. Yeah, of it I'm wondering if you can shed some light on why really it was that President uh, Trump and right maybe his advisors didn't like have any of you people fund. advising him instead of Dr. Fauci. Well, because uh, they want to. You know, I was it. called. Uh, I detailed this in my book. I don't want to bore everyone with all the details, but uh, at the end of July and they asked if I would help the president. And so I said, yes, okay, because there is no other answer, it's my country. Right. Uh, when I got there, the right answer. I was shocked at what I saw because the people on the task force on the medical side were incompetent, didn't know the data, and concerned about self-protection and threatened when I would walk into a meeting with 12 or 15 scientific publications and go through a little mini soliloquy of the data, and they had nothing except you're an outlier, they would say. And they would go to the media. And what happened, the, the question is, what happened uh, really why? There was a, somehow we diverged into a country where we have, our leaders have abrogated their responsibility to lead by saying, oh, that's the CDC guidance. That's what Fauci and Burke say. They were given the authority as opposed to just being there advising and letting the people in charge have the authority. And so now we have somehow a CDC that is taken as a, a law issuer, a rule issuer. That's not what the CDC ever was intended to be. It gives guidance, that's it. Uh, but that's, that's not the current situation. Not the second point I want to make is be, I did the, view myself they, as an advisor that was needed guy. to bring in the experts who knew what They're they were talking change. about. They were actually doing we research. Need to have leaders who and so I set like up a meeting and brought in Martin Koldorf, Jay Bhattacharya, Joe Ladapo, uh, and others, people from Stanford and Harvard and UCLA and uh, Tufts University. Uh, and we met with the president. And the people on the task force specifically, that meeting was scheduled so Dr. Burks could attend. Dr. Burks withdrew from the meeting right before it, it happened. Didn't want to have the discussion with people doing the research. That's not the mark of a scientist. Okay, science is the debate. Science is being able to know the material enough so that you win on the basis of knowing more. Right and now. if you don't know more, your opinion doesn't carry the day. And so we met with President Trump. And the next day we met with the five of us of the people, met with Vice President Pence. And then later I brought in Dr. Gupta Bhattacharya and Kaldorf to meet with Secretary Azar because Secretary Azar wanted to hear answers to his questions. And so we did the best we could. But the bottom line was the authority over the federal guidance to the pandemic was given 
to Drs. Fauci, Burks, and Redfield. And today that continues because it is given, as you've heard our current president say many times, whatever the CDC says, whatever Dr. Fauci says. And that is the uh, really gross uh, malfeasance of leadership, in my opinion. We should so be so lucky be that he was in the room for some of this. Dr. Carriott. Yeah. We would have never well, known. To that, I, I think this problem of the relationship between science and political authority is a very, very difficult one. All of the solutions seem to be in a sort of all or nothing extreme direction. And I've thought a lot about, okay, what, what created that? And it seems to me that the political authorities are going to anoint some scientist or group of scientists to be, you know, in the current climate, the, the experts that we're going to listen to. And unfortunately, you, Dr. Atlas, you just named the ones that were anointed and we all know sort of the results of that. But I think one of the challenges is that the answer to most scientific questions is nuanced, right? The Great Barrington Declaration is, is nuanced in the sense of is COVID, you know, bad? Well, it depends. Are vaccines good or bad? Are they helpful or unhelpful? Well, it depends. It depends on your age group, your risk categories, all, all of these nuance, nuances, which, um, you know, at the, at the journal club, at the medical school, we discuss and it get down into the weeds on. Politicians don't really seem interested in that. They want something for the stump speech. They want an answer. And especially early on in the pandemic, when the media was focused on COVID case counts and COVID death counts, and state by state comparisons. There seemed to be this kind of mimetic rivalry between governors to do more and more extreme measures. Like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm seen as doing more to address COVID if my lockdowns or, you know, my policies are sort of more extreme. And so but my question has to do with how can the nuances of science actually interact with the more binary or all or nothing sort of policy tendencies that you know people who question. are looking to get reelected or or the media i mean i think this has to do with the media as well right they you, you get 60 seconds to do a sound bite and it's hard to it's hard to get a lot of nuance in that context how do scientists interact with those systems without compromising what yeah. we should be good at, which is Dr. subtlety. Just follow Dr. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, I think public health and public health scientists have no choice. Reject ideology. But to trust the public uh, if he wants to be trusted. It has to trust the public yep. by honestly say what we know, yep. by honestly say what we don't know, mm -hmm. um, uh, both of those things. Because what's happening is that public health CDC says something which then turns out to be wrong. So nobody's going to trust CDC then. So the only the only way forward is to be honest, even those things that we don't know about. And it also requires courageous leaders. Okay, we do have people in this country who look at the data and made a decision that use logic. I mean, I could point to several of them. One that everybody talks about is Governor DeSantis. Yeah, but he... We all had, he was, I had conversations with Governor DeSantis since the spring of 2020. Um, we've all appeared on panels and had many conversations. This is a person who makes it his business to know the data and then to make a common sense assessment of what needs to be done. And he's been proven right. Okay, he did better than a lot of states, most states that did the lockdowns and better than my own state of California on a data-driven analysis. And so you need people who are not afraid. And, uh, you know, I once wrote a book uh, in my pre-health policy life called Magnetic Resonance Imaging of the Brain and Spine. And I never, I, I always thought there's, there are people who don't really have a brain, but I never knew how few people had a spine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, nice. That's good. Eric, oh, I just wonder, one, one, one thing I thought you said one. is quite important. Uh, you, you have to have scientific advice. Like if you're a leader, you, 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 just, you just have to, like you, you can't expect political leaders to all have read the scientific literature. That's not realistic. Um, the key thing is, 
that the scientific advisors, they cannot be in a position to silence the rest of the scientific community so that they themselves are seen as the science. Like there, you cannot have a scientific advisor who goes around saying, thinking that if you challenge me, you're not simply challenging a man, you are challenging science itself. Oh, right. Like that, 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 is, uh, uh, that, that is, I think that, that hubris like has been a, a key part of the failed response to COVID in the United States and elsewhere. So, is there a selection bias for those who are sort of more all or nothing or, or lack nuance because that's what some of the politicians want? I agree with whoever's asking this question, I think. Say, well, on one hand or on the other hand, they're not going to call you again. You, you know what I mean? Well, you know, Scott, Scott has a very good way of distil distilling scientific nuance into a compelling way. You can hear him when he, when he speaks, right? There's a reason why presidents can speak, speak with him. I think there's a skill to that. But Scott is also open to, to reading the literature, and I, I will we'll have scientific you see, you know scientific arguments. Well, I mean, to fun, be right? to be honest, I I called these guys and Johnny and Edie's every day to every other day for nine months straight, uh, and so uh, because you need to you need to hear people's opinions. We all can read. We've all reviewed papers. We've all reviewed grants. We've all submitted these things. Uh, but you need to hear what people think and bounce things off of people. That is what it, the, the essence of really coming up with the right answer. I think Martin said something very important too. Uh, the information is needed, not just for the public and to trust the public, and that is, but it's also needed because that's why I brought in a bunch of other people to talk to the president. The presidents, these politicians, they need to hear it they need to get enough uh, divergent opinion so that they can be critical thinkers because it's their responsibility. And so uh, I, I think that, they, again, it, it all boils down to the lack of censorship, the transparency of information, and that, that really is the sort of most obvious solution to most of these things. So, okay. <laughs> I guess a uh, final 30-second uh, thought from each panelist, starting with Martin, and then we'll finish. Oh, Dr. Koldor, pardon me. Uh, uh, well, thank you all for coming here and for listening. And I think... Oh, no. Oh, all right. Maybe there's a time cut off or something. No, 124? Terms of the Enlightenment. everybody here as well as many people around this country and around this world we have to do this together yeah i'll sort of echo what martin said i want to thank everyone for know, understanding happened, the seriousness and the the really the urgency of the problem here the country and the world uh was harmed significantly uh and uh, we can't let that happen again and so I'm very delighted that so many people accepted our invitation to come here also for our event tomorrow. Uh, I must say that there are still people who said they support us, but they wouldn't come tomorrow. They're afraid. Mm -hmm. So this is a problem that is very serious. There's no quick solution. Yeah. I'll let it's going to take the battle. everybody's effort and more and more people to have some uh, sort of commitment and courage and eventually with a wide sort of population basis of getting something good accomplished, we will do it because it will not come from top down. All these things, these changes have to come from bottom up. Yep. That's my phrase. Well, I just want to thank each of you that's come. For many of you, I've learned during the pandemic. I've read, I've read some of your papers. I've, I've uh, uh, frankly, you give me hope that scientific discussion, science is still alive. Uh, and I doubted that sometimes. Uh, mm. during the course of the pandemic. Um, I think in order for science to, to have, uh, to revive, to be what it really should be, it, it's, it's in badly need of a reformation, right? A, a, a reestablishment of, 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 of uh, the, the norms of the enlightenment that uh, to me, it's, it's darkened during the pandemic. Um, and I think uh, this, this effort, you, you all that are in the room, are, I, I, I know will be a big part of that reform and reestablishment of science as a force for good in this world. Well, and let's uh, give them all a hand of applause.
Thank you. That's it. That was quite a trip down memory lane. Oh my God, it's, it's painful. I know. It was all the greatest hits of, uh, gosh, the I last remember. two years. Yeah, I know. Just, just thinking the the frustration of. Yeah, I would always get really excited. I would be like, "Oh, cool, great!" You know, I didn't know who these people were. Actually, I think I had encountered the maybe Jay before, just from you know knowing. I think the Sanford study, right? Stanford, uh, right? And then, um, but uh, certainly didn't know about Sinetra or Malton Caldor. For actually, I can't remember whether or not I read the Jacobin Jacobin, however you pronounce it, article with Martin before or after that. But I didn't, you know, I didn't read any i never read that magazine before and i realized it's you know kind of a you know really really kind of um you know uh uh far far left uh publication and um you know my impression whenever they least i was like oh okay that this is this is great at least we can now we can talk about this like it almost felt like it was like a, okay well I've, i kind of felt this way and it made sense and you know like, hey, here's, you know, I'm not crazy. You know, these people are really, really smart. You know, they're 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 very credentialed and and it opened and it and then it was just, it didn't make sense with the swift the swift and furious attacks upon them, and obviously now it does because a year later we found out that it was incredibly coordinated. It was it was a lot of people that were um, very vested in uh, making them uh, appear to be crazy and um, and then you know, commence the wars on DeSantis and, and Scott, um, you know, it was, it was every bit as, it, it remained every bit as toxic and um, censored as it ever was, even during the election cycle for, a, I mean, a solid year, it seems, you know, I don't know about y'all. I mean, I'm still stuck on what do we do now? And it sounds like that's everybody's issue, right? Because, right. We have this theory that, oh, it's over, COVID's over, everybody's switching mm -hmm. to Russia and the Ukraine, and, and it's a distraction, and, mm -hmm. um, and and it's a way to end it without anybody having to admit they did anything wrong. Right. Yeah. I'm not seeing that. I'm Me, seeing the yeah. hysteria is persisting. Fear is harder to unlearn than learn, and a lot yeah. of people were scared, and a lot of people yeah. invested their identity and ideology. Yeah. It's become right. an orthodoxy. Yes. Yeah. They made a lot of um, stupid decisions. They um, violated a lot of liberties, broke a lot of laws, frankly, colored outside the lines, you know, yep. called audibles, yep. broke everything. And not only that, they actually, most of these people went on record in public, you know, yep. everybody from, you know, the, the policymakers, public health people, mm -hmm. politicians, journalists, uh, blue checks, influencers, even regular people, they sign their name to this stuff. Yeah. And it's, um, yeah. that's a pretty big deal. I think it, it's going to be hard for people to, to admit that they were wrong after going so and, in it to win it. And not, and not only admitting that we were wrong, but also you got to realize that the current state of, you know, if we have, you know, a lot of people's like, for instance, they, they, they criticize the GBD folks for essentially creating a straw man to argue against. They're like, well, no one's proposing a, a hard lockdown anymore. Well, literally weeks later, the UK went back into a lockdown, immediately disproving that. Um, obviously, the state of California was in an incredibly long, um, you know, stay at home order. There were a lot of, you know, obviously school closures. There was, um, uh, in the current state, I mean, you know, look at, someone like Ashish Jha, who's now supposedly the new COVID czar or whatever, we, we currently continue to, um, we've, we've, we've adopted the wartime rhetoric um, and, you know, created new federal departments, completely new funding. You know, we, we are literally funding our way. We've created entirely new, we have, um, Johnny and Edie's wrote a paper recently, um, I think it was called the COVIDization of research. Mm -hmm. um, where he essentially uh, just talks about the degrees of how many citations and how much it's just been obsessive over the last two years. And we're not, we've not really even fully come out of it. Right. You know, we're a lot of people. So I think um, a lot of people in a lot of really important decision uh, making uh, leadership positions persist with that. These were necessary and that they worked. And when that, 
when those two fundamental premises uh, persist, the risk of continuing or repeating them exists. And I think for anyone who's an advocate for both open schools, normal childhood, you know, individual liberties, um, especially, and this is what blew my mind. I think for y'all, you probably were similar. I remember being like really excited about the vaccines because mostly I was like, okay, people were waiting for this and this will change things. And I've always been wrong about that. And so that's why I've been wrong every single time I thought that this degree of hysteria would just sort of dissipate and then and, and then go away. But no, what happens is sort of congeal and, um, you know, there becomes sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I think that it's what's really important what what Martin was saying, what um, Dr. You know, Atlas was saying is that it's important that we establish the truth that we you know, get to publish real critical science that says, hey, these things had a very minimal, if anything, effect. And then also quantifying the harms, right? And that's the other the aspect that needs to be established so that we, um, you know, never do some of these things ever again and uh, get it right the next time. Yeah, no, no off ramps for you. I was kind of, I, 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 you know, the only one I had was the masks, you know, sort of early on. I, I was vaguely pro masks sort of at the end of the spring yeah, of 2020 because so I was well. like, look, you know, we. Well, yeah. need to, yeah, right. We need to open the businesses, right? Anything, yeah, yeah. if we need to put people in, in beekeeper suits, you know, yeah. to keep them safe, you know, sure. great, well, you know, whatever. whatever. Yeah. But as soon as we did that and it was like, they weren't going away. It was like, Oh no. It was, <laughs> oh. It, was re- it was then that I learned that it was a reinforcing of a psychological component of it. It was yep. really, and that was and it's symbolic yes. of, of that, of the, um, you know, essentially hypervigilance, you know, hypervigilance was essentially we've, we've rather than courageousness and like understanding risk. And essentially, you know, if you're like a younger, healthy person, like, you know, absorbing an, a risk on behalf of others, right. To get through and get to, you know, better population immunity should have actually, we kind of should have been like, you know, well, well good for you. I mean, like the more, the more of that that we have, the more we can protect those are really, really at risk. Right. Um, so just this seeing the, I just remember seeing people neighbor turn against neighbor, the things that were so visit about people just wanting, you know, how dare these people open their business? How dare, you know, it was just the vitriolic way. And the thing is, is yes, those fear tends to bring those things out. And we, and I think that's will always exist to some extent. But what happened is our public health essentially fed that. I mean, they fed it. It was oh, it, they, they they accelerated. They threw gasoline on that fire and it made things so much worse, you know, because they essentially really wanted to. I mean, like you said, they wanted to convince people, um, oh, to take this seriously, you know, um, and, it, the, and it led to a lot of uh psychological harm and um you know dehumanizing of others you know taking the taking the personality away from people by making everyone have a blank face and unable to smile i mean to me that um even if masks did work a little bit right you know is something you know that was completely ignored that should have been paid attention to well and i think that brings up a really important thought is that, yes, so we can probably agree that transparency in public health is the way to go and to be able to have these honest conversations, but that assumes some sort of good faith effort on the people who have been acting in bad faith for two years. Right. And that has to be atoned for in some way. It just has to. It really, it really does. It really does. So who, okay. So I think you guys, we know each other pretty well, the four of us, but um, so you guys know that I'm, I've been pretty staunchly apolitical through this whole thing because I just didn't want to get my hands dirty. I didn't want to get accused of any sort of political motivations. Right. Um, but at this point, I don't see how anybody can remain apolitical because that's how, that's how we change leadership. That's how we change representatives. That's how we, how we pick who, who, who puts the people in the positions who are doing these things. It's for us, by us, and right. of us. Is there any other way? Well, hold on. That assumes that the it's only by party line that people make good decisions and follow science, data, and logic, right? That's a great point. Yeah. So yeah. I, I'll give an example. 
because I'm in New York, the the freedom fighters that I'm working with, it's not really my community. My community is actually more conservative actually, here on Long Island. And because of that, our schools are always the ones right at the, um, you know, the governor's door fighting, fighting, fighting. The ones that are always in the news for, oh, they were going to defy the governor, but then the governor threatened to pull their funding. You know, like it was always in my area and because that most of the area is that way. But that's not who's really going to change the state. It's what's in New York City. So in New York City, you know, very um, Democrat, liberal, progressive, very. It's the angry Brooklyn moms, right? It's the that group which I am thankfully invited into I, earlier on, I was kind of a fish out of water, right? But I get along great and we, we have get togethers and they're great people, but it's them. It's those moms and dads and husbands and wives and just individuals who are fed up and they see it like they, it was an awakening, but they don't, it's not that they change their politics though. And they say this all the time. They say, I, yep. what, wasn't it um, Bill Maher who was just saying Same it with Ben Shapiro the other day? He's like, yep. I, I didn't, my politics didn't change. At least I don't think so. They're like, I still believe in progressive values, and right. you know, and they'll, they'll. I'm sure you do too, AJ. Like, there's still mm -hmm. certain things that are reasons they're progressive that haven't changed. Mm -hmm. Why can't there be a candidate or candidates that yep. are Democrats that believe those things, but also yeah. aren't completely clouded by the craziness with COVID? And those need to emerge. The problem is for those to emerge, you know, you got to have funding. Yeah. Right. You got a funding to to w really win a seat. I mean, maybe in your board of education, which I even lost, right? <laughs> and that's yeah. not even a paid gig. It's hard. So yeah. I, that's my response to that, AJ. Is I hear what you're saying is you almost have to be political. You don't have to change your politics, but you might have to vote differently in order to escape the when, tyranny, the medical authoritarian. We need people that are brave. I mean, yeah. we need people that are, and I say leaders, we need um we need it to, I think, foster a culture that is not curated by algorithms, right? That's curated by personal connection and by individuals learning and being with people completely different than them, you know? And, you know, that's one of the things that um, I think that, you know, especially academics in their academic bubble, they love to think they can solve the world's problems. They've always thought that way, right? They always thought they could defeat COVID, right? They, they could do everything from their, you know, their, uh, with their tenure. I mean, they can, as long as they're okay, you know, let me solve everybody so and dictate to what you want to do. We need moderates. We need moderism. We need um, we need we need people in politics, and we need people in business uh, that are willing to say, "Hey, I, you know, um, to me, politics is you know everyone. There's politics plays a role. Everything's been politicized, though, so we don't need politics and everything. We need people who are willing to say." I don't stand with you on all these other issues, but, um, but I, that, but I think that, I think that there's a difference between, you know, politics and politicization, exactly. Polit politicization. Right. Um, and it's, it's funny cause I, I live in New York too. And it's, I'm, I'm on, I'm in Westchester, right. Which is sort of super blue. It's not as blue as a city, but, um, you know, I, I've definitely run into the same, um, you, you know, cadre of of people who are um essentially like former you know former default dems at least a lot of them were like bernie bros and you know yeah. bernie bernie babes and the one the one thing that i've noticed that is a little bit of a of a connective tissue is the classical liberal stuff and um it's funny. I've actually been doing a little bit of a deep dive on like progressive, like the history of progressivism, and it and it came out sort of the other side of the Gilded Age, and it was at the turn of the century, and even the Republican Party was going like full on progressive, and it was like this battle, and then Woodrow Wilson kind of um, came to the fore, and and sort of became essentially like liberalism with big government force behind it, right? Um, but the the connective tissue really seems to be this uniquely American, um, you know, set of values that are ensconced in our, our founding documents and our bill of rights. And these are, you know, very liberal freedoms that, you know, every time we, we, we see somebody, you know, people in another country fighting for their freedom, you know, against the man, these are, these are our values. These are, you know, freedom of association, freedom of speech, you know, liberty, all this stuff. That's what they want. And our country is the only country on earth that has that yep. baked into our DNA. 
right? Yes. So what I'm trying to get at is absolutely. I really think that this is one of the silver linings that I see, and this is to, to Clay's point, is that there is a, a weird sort of around the around the bend connection connection of people who truly understand the importance of liberty and the individual and personal responsibility and you know the rule of law to some extent you know these are very very basic things that you know this yeah. progressive hooey you know that bill maher was talking about and clay was just talking about it's just it, it doesn't it doesn't matter and it's also harmful and you can see how when it sort of becomes cancerous right this this sort of government force um you know, almost like quasi-religious secularism, um, it turns bad wrong and it has government force behind it. And it causes a lot of damage. And I think that that's what everybody that we know is responding to and like, no, <laughs> we cannot have well, that. And that, right. it's, 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 it's just been in the same way that kind of moderate centrist is not really the right word because that kind of means they pick an arbitrary middle. And I don't, I don't really agree with that, but say moderate folks that are reasonable, common sense, logical like dr bhattacharya you know dr atlas um <laughs> who've never actually been extremist about anything you know if you if you divorced all of their comments and you were somehow to be able to like read their comments to people in 2018 or 19 on the far left or far right they'd be like yawn i mean this is what you know <laughs> but um we've uh we've been uh normal so american fundamental values you know we do have an ideology and that is the American ideology. You know, we Dude. have fundamental. God bless you guys. Yes. And that okay, ideology. And, I, and I'm not ashamed to say it either. It's like, it's, it's not like America or anything. And it's, it's just. And, get, and guess what? It's superior to others because what it does is it values diversity. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. You have to have the many first, and then you get to the one. And what you have is you have unity when you have diversity, and you have strength in that. And what happens is these First Amendment principles, free, you know, free association, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, they protect both sides equally. And what's happened is that the, the press, the mainstream media has created this sort of pseudo monopoly, along with big tech, a pseudo monopoly of the viewpoint that they like. And so what's what's this perverse thing has occurred where it's sort of like, oh, well, these guys over here on the right wing they're using words like freedom and, you know, their individual rights and my freedoms. And they, they, what they did is they completely, completely bastardized the, the fundamental liberties that protect both extremes. Yeah. Like we, that it, it equally protects those on the very far left. It equally protects those on the, on the far right and those in the middle as well. Um, and what we, associated our fundamental rights and so fundamental civil liberties with the right wing as if only those people cared. And it's like you, it, it was really amazing to watch that people were pro censorship, pro, um, you know, removal of uh, basic liberties of free association and um, the ability of movement, right. You know, that, that, that was so easily dismissed and that i think is one of the really existential issues uh where we need to realize that hey it's we need to realize that our american um idea ideals uh, equally protect everyone you know from both sides you okay know. See, but that's what that's what totally freaks me out because mm -hmm. i i agree with you guys 100 percent that this is a matter of principles over party that we should, mm -hmm. we should all, that these ideas and values are ensconced in our founding documents. Yep. And yet, I mean, I tweeted this the other day that I used to believe that we lived in the land of the free in the home of the Brit. Like that's who we were. And this past two years has absolutely shaken that belief for yeah. me. Yeah. I mean, do you agree? <sighs> yeah, it's, it's, it, I'm not it, saying we can't get it back. I'm just saying. I do. We've gotten soft. Holy we we have well yeah. when you when you're reading like Alexander Soltz's Yetsen, I always can't pronounce his name, and reading people like uh, and you go back and you look in history and you look at these scary patterns and it makes you think, okay, we need optimism, we need uh, enthusiasm, and we need um, to believe again in in each other, and we need to be able to connect with people who I don't you know 
I, I can completely reject half of the stuff that you stand for, but I can agree with your ability to think it and to say it, you know, and like, we just we need to, to really agree on that. everything to agree on anything. Yeah. Like that is yeah, not that's falsehood. And yeah. yeah, there's something fundamentally, I feel like cultural, something in the ethos that is wrong. Something's wrong. It's, um, it, is, it feels like it's been brewing for a while. Yeah. You know, um, so just, that's what we got to figure out. How do we fix yeah. it? That. Super quick to something Josh said um, a couple minutes ago um, about sort of these values being, you know, you know, maligned as you know, like right wing. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because they actually are. I mean, it, it, in, in America, so right wing comes from the, the French Revolution, right? Um, essentially, the left side of the of the um, the table or the council were the complete radicals. They wanted to to destroy everything and burn everything down and start from scratch. And the right side was like, oh, let's not go that far. And they were still they were still in the French Revolution, but they were like, hold on, let's keep some vestige of you know um, of structure here. So you know that's how right wing became synonymous with conservative, which is you know the dictionary definition is to conserve. In America, if you separate moral and religious conservatism from governmental conservatism, which you should. Sometimes they overlap, but a lot of times they don't. I'm a really good example of that. I'm a, I'm a governmental conservative, but I'm not um, a social conservative. Um, in our country, to conserve right wing is to stick up for those foundational values, those liberal greatest hits of the of the Bill right. of Rights. And that's where you know, sort of our language and our, you know, the epithets that we throw and like, oh, that's right wing or you're right. It's like, well, yeah. it's a little bit more complicated than we, right. we like to pretend it is. And I actually think it's in a good way because, right. again, there's, there's nothing wrong with being a, a governmental American conservative because all that means is that you, right. that you support the basic system of our government, which I think is ingenious. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, geez. and by the way, federalism, right? The states, these quasi little autonomous, the 50 little autonomous things that really are only, you know, bound together with the federal government, you know, only allowed to do like, you know, a handful of things, which by the way, it's completely, you know, gone past its, um, its remit there. Um, federalism is, is probably what's going to save our butts in the long run because of Florida, right? They were allowed to do Yep. Yeah. kind of what they wanted to do. And they showed us that that was the right way. That's yeah. a really great point that yeah. I hadn't thought about. There's, there, we, we still have a system Which where one? it is designed. The federalism. The right. idea that yeah. we have 50 different states. Laboratory of democracy, you, baby. Yeah, that's fantastic. There's a free market. It's like a policy free market that's built in. Right? Yeah. It's like, oh, they're going to try this stuff over you here. Gotta, you got to remember compete. when we were founding the country, they didn't want to be a country. You know, They wanted to be their own states. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? They were like, "Hey, we're Pennsyl we're we're the country of Pennsylvania," and they were like, yeah. "No, no, no, let's let's be let's be smart about this." So, yeah. right. Well, if we tie it back around to censorship, which is how we got here, right. what do we like? We heard what Martin and Jay and Scott all thought about what to do with science. Like, I think we all three of us have experienced some degree of censorship over the last two years, mm -hmm. and it, and it seems to be getting worse. It seems to be escalating. Oh, where do we go with that? What about our fundamental values says that? Okay, that's okay. I remember when the ACLU came out and said, it's uh, awful. restrictions are civil liberties. I'm like, They're just cuckoo what? for Cocoa Puffs. They just, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, so that draws back to that, that question I of think, um, what's going what, on. What can we do? Is it, is it getting right? worse though? I, I it, it's weird. I, I think I it's, getting, it's, it's, getting it's hard. It's getting better in some ways. Every and time I've tried to make kinda... a proclamation about that, I've been wrong. So I'm I'm hesitant <laughs> to say that it's, you know, I've been wrong repeatedly, and that is that the hysteria and you know the addiction to restrictions would go away. I've never been right about that. So, but yeah. to your question, what should we do? Um, talk to your neighbors. Go go meet with and hang out with people that are totally different than you. Write something, write a letter, post things, you know, um, do uh, refuse to feel afraid, which is what they want. They want you to feel like you refuse to, uh, you know, have courage and write 
um, what you feel and be open to being corrected and, and being attacked. So yeah. I think the best thing that anyone can, and I think us three, we, we've been there, we've all been there and accused and attacked and, I mean, heck even deplatformed. And, um, I mean, people make a lot of effort to turn us into things that we're not, uh, because of the vitriolic and toxic nature of this. But, um, when you speak to people face to face that are different than you and maybe, you know, that we, we have to, it's just like, uh, you said, AJ, uh, during the, um, thing, it's a, it's a bottom up thing. And when, when you have a, uh, you know, we have systems of democracy in place to where, um, eventually there will be hopefully some change where when the majority view is these things were harmful, uh, we should never repeat them. And that censorship is too high of a cost for a free and democratic nation. And that becomes, that must be the pervasive view. It has to be. That was the view before 2020. And right. it took 20 years for the Iraq war to be seen as kind of futile and not really worth it. And probably all that. And I, oh, and now, now I, I hope to God that it doesn't take that long. Again. I, I hope to God it doesn't take that long. I hope it takes, you know, I would love for it to take a couple of years, but I think it's going to be a long journey where eventually we need to establish that. So, but don't be afraid. That's the answer. I think you're right. I think courage. Not, not, and, and trying not to self-censor. I mean, even Martin says he does it. It's um, hard though. Once you, once you get stung, it's like, yep. But you can get to a point where you don't have much left to lose. You're like, all right. That is true. Yeah, so let's keep going. That is true. Well, I mean, I'm not giving up. I know you guys no. aren't giving up. None of us are giving up. You, you know, one thing That's I think is- That's why we show up tonight and give yes. two hours yeah. of our time to talk about this with other people who want to talk about it. Well, one thing I think is, is troubling to me is, it, it, it's weird. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big free marketeer, but um, the getters and the truths and the parlors- and there's something about this this self siloing, and again, it's not self. I think if Twitter and Facebook didn't freaking ban everybody, like everybody would still be there, right? Like I don't, you know, they're almost creating their own competition by by being jerks. But um, you know, I don't like this siloing. You know, um, I don't no. particularly want all the MAGA people to go over to Getter and Truth, and I don't want all the the you know the the liberals and covidians to stay on twitter i mean i don't want that to happen i like everybody in the same public square so that's yep. that's one thing i'm trying to keep my eye on i have no solution for that at all but like you know that's something well, that I, so I see that i don't think this is, is what was so in, in this this so this is what was so crazy when you think about the self reinforcing nature of like lockdowns in the virtualization of everything um, was because then we, the de facto arbiter of information became a few corporations um, and media. I mean, right. we essentially, in that, the de facto arbiter of information and even kind of like community exchange and just like basic, you know, I mean, people in your, your the next door, you're, you're seeing what's going on with Facebook about them before you walk over. I mean, during lockdowns and restrictions. So it became a self-reinforcing thing where it was, awful. It was digitized. So unhelpful. We saw the worst versions of, of ourselves. So, well, nobody, people should never do anything in person. And what it did was then foster a good this point. toxicity, which then was self-reinforcing that we should keep yep. doing. And the reality is, is that in real life is so much different. And, you know, if, if we didn't have, I, I can't help but think that if, if this pandemic had happened then, even just like 2001, you know, maybe even just, maybe, maybe even in 1999 or, I mean, we had the internet, but it wasn't fast. It wasn't ubiquitous. There weren't smartphones that it would have just been a lot different and we would not yeah. have had the degree of, of social fabric, um, self owning or self uh, destruction i really do i think yeah i'm a i'm a technologist by trade you know but i uh, i think that it made it worse i really do agree uh, there's great uh, things about it like this what we're doing but i think that it made societally uh it it's worse what did you call it virtualization the virtualization of of society right that's spot on that's spot on because people i mean they could drive by a hospital mm mm-hmm. mhm See the parking lot empty. Yep. Read a headline that said yep. hospitals are overwhelmed. Which are they yep. going to lend more credence to? Yep. This virtual environment, this information they got off the internet, or what yep. they saw with their own eyes? Yep. 
yeah, it's a it's an interesting precedent. I think I hope that we snap out of it, and that's why you have to go love on your neighbor. That's you smart. Know? <laughs> you're gonna get you're gonna get us in trouble. So love <laughs> on your neighbor. <laughs> Not well, I'm a, I'm an old school. I'm, you know, golden rule, you know, treat people the way you would like to be treated. Isn't that in the and, 10 commandments? Thou shalt not well, love no. thy neighbor. Oh. <laughs> well, the, you know, and maybe that's when, when all these mandates were coming along, I was like, well, you know, I kind of like someone to treat me like a human, you know, and maybe that I wasn't like a weird freak. And, you know, and so that's why I'm, I'm just going to decide to treat people that way. You know, yeah. I won't demand they restrict their breathing or their face just to be around me. And so. Yeah, some, you know, even if it so does I'm a nut job, spread obviously. a virus, like maybe that's just the, maybe that's a fair choice. I mean, right. I don't want to wear a mask regardless. <laughs> I don't want you to. I just don't. Yeah. I think, I think there's some parts of our humanity that are worth, worth preserving at the cost of other. Absolutely. Things. Yeah. So thank All you right, guys. guys. Yeah, this was cool. They, they, they're awesome. It was cool um, to do a positive one, right? Instead of like, a, oh, you guys. Are yeah, we were like, just, yeah. you know, we're not going to be yelling at them this time. What, <laughs> what was the What was the last ones you guys did? Oh gosh, uh, Ron Johnson, I think. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then we did a Biden. We did a, one of Biden's speeches before that. And it was oh, like, that was yelling at him. I loved your Kamala monologue. That was so good. Do that again if you if you do it. I want that to be a series. You know, I just want you to do. Uh, but do more dramatic lighting and maybe like, you know, to where it's like, you know, maybe. Oh, like, the Kamala monologue. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it was tough, man. That's just word salad, and it's uh, it's hard to. It's weird. It's it was hard. I wrote down exactly what Kamala said. And I tried to repeat it back badly, and I just I couldn't make it as bad as she did. It was frustrating. That's really special. All right, All right guys, have All a right. good night. All right. Absolutely. Thanks, Thank you, everybody. Bye around. We'll do it again. Bye.